thanks for you inviting me here, and I'm very happy to come here to talk about my, my topics. And yeah, I'm, my name is Seppo Kalanen, I'm from uh, uh, Turku University, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm an astronomer. Uh, I've been doing this uh, all my life, this kind of work. We were part of the staff study, uh, studies, and yeah, I am mostly concentrated with collectors, with variables of different kind, and especially magnetic systems. And I, I have a uh, um, study in Turku, my master thesis, and after that I did my PhD in Turku. My supervisor was Turku Firola, so that's why I'm so interested in polar energy like that. But also many other astronauts in Turku are happy to the polar energy, so the and especially the Finnish astronomers are very, uh, generally quite many involved in somehow polar energy, spectral polar energy, whatever. Especially if you talk about the, some ISO, ISO astronomers like the Andreas Kaufer, the, uh, the Paranal Masia director, once said that, oh, you Finnish you always do some polar energy. That's what they easily talk and said. Then some other Finnish might have to sometimes have to be explained. No, no, we are not. Not doing the polar, everybody are doing the polar. So there are just the, the very, very active groups. And yeah, but then, anyway. And so one, I'm one of those who is uh, very, very keen on polar energy and this kind of studies. And to make it, to make it full screen? Uh, well, maybe we have the full screen, but it, it is a little bit, a little bit here oh, yeah, yeah. in the laptop screen. And I actually tested it, but, but, uh, but maybe if it doesn't. But by the two months, uh, I will keep it here because I don't know. I tried to get it uh, somehow from here, the full screen, the drop, the jump here, but yeah. it's possible to complicated. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still happy at this little little that it works even that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, but but okay. Let's let's hope that you can still follow this. This one is not exactly full scale. Okay, very shortly to sum up what what they said. Some of them you might be very, very, let's say, familiar with uh, these characteristic variables, but if not, everybody are familiar. Even the, if you keep the seminar in your, your uh, the professional astronomers, uh, that's what I normally explain quite a lot of what, what are these uh, targets and what kind of systems they are. Because uh, you, it's, uh, you kind of assume that everybody knows exactly how the characteristic variables are, what, what kind of systems they are. So, there are binary star systems uh, in which it is said that the separation of the components is comparable to the diameter of the stars. So they are very close binaries. Uh, uh, we have lots of different binaries and some of them are very wide, but now in these categories we are talking about very, very, very close systems. And very complex. Actually, uh, it means that the, the nano is uh, like a normal red dwarf, but the, the main star is uh, very compact. Uh, and in categories, the key is uh, White dwarf, but if you replace the white dwarf with an neutral star or small mass uh, uh, black dwarf, then you get a system uh, is called uh, X ray, small mass, low mass X ray binary. But, but I mostly studied uh, the Katakuru's film, which means you have a white dwarf yeah. in the center. So that's how it, uh, uh, that explains a little bit. And so the, uh, the key here is this rational, so that there will be this. Must transfer uh, you, that uh, this uh, secondary field, the rush law, and the mass transfer starts to, to flow towards this primary, which is the white dwarf. And they normally, normally, that happens, we have an accuracy in this. Uh, we have then the special cases where, where the accuracy in this is, uh, formation of the accuracy in this is uh, prevented, you know, a very, I mean, the huge family field strength. And that's uh, which I have really concentrated these targets, especially in my PhD work several years ago, was mostly about those. And yeah, this is the obvious impression how it's normally if we assume, how we assume it should look like. Uh, so the, the, the secondary is uh, quite cool, red dwarf, some few, let's say three or four thousand Kelvin surface temperature, it's a little bit cooler than some and small mass star. And uh, white dwarf here. Okay, so what are these? So they are compact semi detached primaries. And um, yeah, white dwarf and red dwarf are. And red dwarf is filling the Rosh and Rosh is, 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 you can calculate it from 
parameters. So this the theoretical uh, surface where it, when it finally reaches this the, the mass accuracy start, starts. And there are a few cases uh, in this evolution of these binaries. There is a, a moment when this uh, is lost this contact. So the so the period gap between the orbital periods two and three hours where the the, the different instability is this stars uh, shrinks a little and it's where it feels rough slope again when the orbital period uh, uh, will be reduced uh, down to two hours and then the mass transfer starts. So the, it's very important. And also the most most of the people never even realize that this kind of a system is actually never going to work if the system parameters are not constantly in the chains. I mean, that when, because there's a mass transfer. So this, uh, the mass ratio changes also constantly. And if there wouldn't be, uh, even though, despite that there has never been any measurements of the gravitational radiation, we need here as an explanation where, 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 uh, where the system loses its angular momentum. We need the, the an idea that it's lose part of this angular moment, momentum with a gravita, gravitational radiation, so it can uh, do this, this constant adjusting and this rotational uh, contact will be maintained and the uh, accuracy will, will go on. Otherwise, without this uh, losing the angular momentum, the system will stop quite soon with an accuracy, accuracy system. So, why? Why these? Well, why not somebody would be interested in this, even a professional level? So, especially the very short orbital period system, a few hours, which they typically have, they make them very interesting. You could do a lot, uh, lots of observations, and they repeat the cycles, get to some uh, statistic, like uh, so many other kind of uh, astronomical studies, that the time scales might be very long, tens of years, maybe even totally chaotic, like most of the quasar studies in the Tour also, where there's a, about a half of people who are studying the uh, quasars. And I even studied my, my master level studies, and I did my master thesis actually from quasars. And there's only one system in OJ287 which is known to have uh, some kind of variation it's within 12 years. But even 12 years is quite a boring uh, time scale uh, to study something. But here you can, within a few nights, collect uh, several cycles from these stars to get to some reliable data. And even though what I recent, recently have been very interested in the AM, uh, CM, ALCD, and actually the ABCD and uh, AM, Cardis, Beta, the core stars, they are now generated systems which can be, uh, be only like a, the orbital of like 10 to 20 minutes, which is a very extreme. And in the shortest one of, the, of, of these double degenerates, for the five minutes orbital periods. This is totally incredible. And they are very strong X-ray targets, both soft and hard X-rays, and ultraviolet, infrared, and of course optical emission. And uh, they actually are the one of the strongest X-ray sources in the whole galaxy, especially the intermediate polars. And so the accuracy of physics flower is actually, and in some of these small fraction of this system has very strong magnetic fields. So this is extremely strong. Maybe even not that strong, like in a some of these uh, neo pulsars and natal stars, but but uh, but not ma maybe one or two decades uh, less, but let's say like a hundred, uh, two one hundred and two hundred megagauss magnetic fields. This is a huge, like you compare the magnetic fields traveling in the solar spots, which is about this one kilogauss. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. But here we are talking about megagauss is at hundred megagauss or two hundred megagauss. Yeah, and of course the classical nova belongs to this cataclysmic. Uh, classical nova have the large outburst uh, of 16 and 13, like something like 19 magnitude. Uh, outburst of a classical nova is a result of the terminal flavor runaway in the matter activated on the surface of white dwarf, which AX an expanding envelope. And especially interesting cases are recurrent nova, there are 10 uh, galactic recurrent nova nodes. And uh, okay, this is how the typical NOAA light curve flow shows it. Brightens up to that, uh, let's say, like more than 10 magnitudes, just been in a few days, and then finally it fades back to the normal. Well, let's say within a few tens of days, sometimes it might, might last a few months, or maybe one year almost. 
So ma maximum visual brightness of course in this cluster when the so-called pseudo photosphere reaches maximum radius. And after the action, the hydrogen remaining on the skinny white dwarf continues burning near the ethan limit for several weeks, up to several years. So and it's a very good example of the recurrent of our outputs of several amulets repeating every 10 to 80 years. That example is D Pux. Actually, D Pux had, uh, had had something like about 20 years something. It actually was found in Henrietta Levy early 20th centuries from the photographic plates and, and it had like 1966. And then there was a long gap, an exceptional long gap until just uh, 2011 and, and 2012 it had this outburst. Uh, some people even were worried about that because there was an unexceptional long barrier without an NOVA outburst that uh, this might explode as a uh, supernovae. And uh, what was this time? Is it 3,000 like years so or something like that? Some people were worried about that if it, it might, might have effect in uh, life in Earth. Uh, maybe it wasn't too Three years ago, or something. One research group in AA, the American Astronomical Society, I'm on meeting. They uh, maybe they just wanted to publish it, but they found this. Uh, they uh, they said the abstract was about uh, will this uh, deep pux explode as a supernova, and uh, it uh, somehow spread around the media in the whole world. And there was, uh, and you can still find it uh, using Google those those articles and uh, what will happen if. Okay, Arthur will talk about more TPX tomorrow and um, Arthur has some ideas of willing to explore or not, but there's a lot of will tell you more about that. So, okay, some interesting subclasses among these fields I have these studies is polars and intermediate polars. Polars are the strongly magnetic field systems. And intermediate, well, they are somewhere intermediate. They do have quite strong magnetic fields, but actually nobody had, uh, uh, this is, uh, has been last 30 years an interesting question because it's always assume that they have a much weaker field than these polars. It, uh, but this, uh, but, uh, but they always say that they have to have something like one million megawatt probably all. But, but in recent years we have identified uh, several uh, new uh, internet polars yeah, which have been, uh, which has shown similar magnetic field strength than the polars. So there's a good question, what's, what makes them different? Okay, they do have an accuracy in this kind of, uh, uh, they rotate the asynchronized. Uh, okay, these ACVs are these double decade rays, very interesting. Okay, they, they show that what's the ACV? And kind of the core star, both are white dwarfs, so double decade ray. And the accuracy is, uh, which might be the, is composed primarily of helium, and actually the whole star there, uh, the, some of these are mostly helium stars. The very small orbital barriers, uh, about 24 is. No one has scored this for the longer is it 5 minutes and uh, some of the shortest the longest one had 40 minutes. So like with the contactless comparable, the shortest of the longer areas, when you have a main sequence star, or at least almost main sequence stars as a secondary, it's about 65 to 70 minutes. Uh, but even there's a, uh, a problem with the observations and theories, people like it has observed, people have just observed CV shortest, uh, just about 80 minutes. Uh, or not, whereas the theorists say that this would be 65. But anyway, these uh, guys can uh, rotate much faster because they have a basic with stars. So, so a question there. So, so they, these systems are immensely more complex uh, than any, any uh, regular uh, star system. Uh, yes. Because, uh, and especially the evolved system can be. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, these have had to contract uh, a lot uh, yes. in the orbit. So, so what kind of time scales we are talking about from the formation of the system like this, where the both stars becoming degenerate mm -hmm. till, till you can get to this point? I don't remember. Maybe it's still some uh, few hundred, hundred of millions of years yes. still because they have yeah, they, well because they they are still white dwarfs and they and they are not very massive stars when they mm -hmm. originate. Where, where they originate, they are still uh, like the solar mass stars, more or less. And they, are, they are not like the very few, very massive stars might just evolve within a few millions of years, but uh, I would guess that it takes still a few hundred of millions of 
PSP wall. So yeah. maybe it's yeah. but, it, but it doesn't take billions of years uh, from the formation of no the white dwarfs to get something like yeah. that. No. So, so it's still a reasonable landscape. Yeah, that's, that's, yes. And also, interesting here, uh, it's hard to talk about, I don't know how much hard we will talk about uh, this uh, recurrent renewal TV exposure. But for example, the, this, uh, this is, they provide one way to produce one a supernova. And I would guess that when, in the near future, so we will soon and soon get some more info about this, uh, the classical series that actually there are not many kind of systems where you can produce one a supernova. This by the people always again here assume that in a classical supernova, uh, like some recurrent noah, we will finally go close to the Sandra uh, Shekla living, uh, the, the main white dwarf, and wow, it will be explored as a one day supernova. It actually is not that straightforward, easy. There are some evidences that it might be not, not, not go exactly like that at all. But these kind of very weird cases, like you have uh, two uh, degenerate stars rotating east, uh, very closely, and if they're enough massive, of course, not not all of these, uh, even the number of these is very small. But not not, not all of these are so that they, uh, so if they merge, that it will be uh, uh, sun mass. Like they might be like both of these are like a half the solar mass, but even less. But there are a few cases where it's, it could be possible. And of course, we know only so little, small number of these. There are some theoretical estimates that they should be. A, Easily one million of these in galaxy or so. And this is very interesting. And I guess that in the future we will need more like these to show that where the one-day supernovas are coming. Okay, then these strongly magnetic systems, the polars, they are even so strong that the the the, the rotation of the fire system is is locked with strong magnetic fields which are up to even the 200 megagauss. And also this accretion here is captured uh, along the magnetic field lines uh, so-called cowling reasons. So there, there's no accretion this or in this uh, so-called intermediate polar, they, they have a disk. But the intermediate polar, they do have a disk, but they have okay, the polar. Uh, so the ma ma material is falling to the two poles from here up along the field lines. But uh, the internet polars, they have a disk, but there is a certain area where finally the matter is uh, uh, captured along the feed lines towards the white form. Okay. And so, in catalytic particles, the plasma is decelerated from supersonic speed, which are about like 5,000 kilometers to subsonic speeds, and this, the matter is heavily heated in this breaking, and then it's okay, when it's heated, then it has to cool. And this cooling curve is actually producing all the interesting things like this brain strong and cyclotron and quantum cooling and, and what we see as in the X-rays, hard X-rays, soft X-rays and optical, you know, like in infrared and, 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 in, and the cyclotron is opti in optical and infrared. And actually that's what we are observing, the products of different cooling processes in these systems. And especially this is when the magnetic and the magnetic field line and the electrons are spiraling uh, in the magnetic field, it produces this cyclotron emission. Okay, so the cyclotron emission uh, comes when the magnetic field and the electron is spiraling. Uh, we call the cyclotron emission when the speed of these electrons are like the one tenth of the uh, speed of light. Like you know, especially the hexagalactic cluster, you have a, it's a magnetic field, uh, mm -hmm. and in the magnetic field, the uh, electron is spiraling almost the speed of the light, it is called the uh, superdome radiation. And here the cyclotron emission is with many hours a little less speed in this, uh, these electrons. They are not that fast like uh, in superdome. And it produces typically this kind of humps in the spectra, broad humps in the spectra, which are easy to detect in the spectroscopy. Well, I don't that easy to have either, uh, either higher or low state of the system, or either then you have to extract the, the secondary star uh, away from the sun, so that you know, that's is very straight part actually. And when we look directly at the feed line, upright motion is circular and this is producing so very ra rare phenomenon circular polarized uh, uh, line. Like normally if you look at any astronomical book, astro books about the uh, astron astronomy handbook and uh, let's say the basic fundamental astronomical uh, books in uh, university lectures, 
they might mention that, okay, the circular polarization is so rare that you don't need in astronomy. And in normally in astronomy, polarization means linear polarization. They almost they all the books normally they just ignore that there is any circular but In this weird system, we do have circular polarization. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just as a comment yeah. on that, uh, yeah. it's also when we, when we are studying magnetic fields on, on stars, uh, yeah. just, uh, you want to study polarization of the light due to the magnetic field, yeah. uh, or polarization of, of the uh, spectral lines. Mm -hmm. And the polarization isn't very strong, but it's actually easier to detect the circular polarization. So many people are, you, uh, as you, well, in fact, all people are using only the circular polarization because that's the only thing you can use. The linear one is so weak you can't detect. Yeah, it's quite often. Also here, same the linear, uh, because the, in this strong magnetic system, we can most of the time we can see in the spectrum the circular, but. Uh, but uh, we can also see the short, short during the short fraction of the orbital where we can see the moment where the field light is seen side on an electron spiral around the field light will appear to be oscillating perpendicularly to the field line. And in that short moment we can detect the so-called linear polarization pulse. But this is also very important if if we think about this binary system because this linear polarization, especially these pulses, when you see it exactly the perpendicularly to the field line. You can then fix the geometry exactly, get the orbital inclination, and then that's why the linear polarization measurements are important. And for the, if you get all the orbital inclination, then you can finally get from the mass ratio what are the real masses of the binary components, etc. etc. Okay, and then the secondaries are the main secondary stars. Well, may, might be most cases, but sometimes non solar binary abundances are present and they might be slightly cool. Okay, and the final evolution, especially this is the one of the main reasons why we are studying. What's the final evolution is? And especially this one A supernova is all more. Because one A supernova is nowadays since that the late 1990s been you know, very popular to use all the astronomers. And, uh, half of the uh, astronomers are mostly studying the uh, extragalactic things, cosmological things, and they're always just assuming that they're always the exact one. Uh, the minus 19.3 magnitude where the one day supernova explodes. But, uh, well, there are even now some studies and research groups which might, uh, might, um, uh, might uh, in the future show that it's not that straightforward. But even the, the st standard candles might not be standard exactly uh, all the time. There are possibilities that, uh, like which I said, like these AMC stars, if there are two enough massive. Uh, white dwarf, it's merged, and it explodes, it will explode as one a supernova. But it might be that when it explodes, if there are enough mass, like a little bit more than one solar mass, you can, it produce the explosion. So, there's a two solar mass, more than two solar mass actually, it's, it goes, goes over the summer sector limit. And even there are now a few uh, papers published where people are talking about super summer sector mass. As a, so that it might stay even after the merging if it's rotating fast. It might stay short time without uh, finally, without immediately exploding as a uh, one-day supernova. And so I guess that the astrophysics is not yet exactly ready here. Okay, but then the power has an access tool. Uh, so I have been using this as my main tool in my studies. It's like using the last telescope uh, in these variable stars. Uh, okay, the minor field strength estimates and also the modeling the, the location and size of the accretion region on the surface of the white dwarf, where this, uh, you know, like I saw the picture, this painter painting where you saw that uh, this accretion flow is close to the two different poles of the magnetic system. And they always have a two poles, of course, like every magnet has a two poles, but the accretion on the di different poles is not the always, it's always a little bit different. It might be that just the one accretion pole is dominating and another stream in the other pole is much weaker. It's quite often the case. So even the, and the, these spots, they are not... Some systems, it's okay that they are round say small, but quite often they spread uh, like something like a pencil shape. Uh, and it varies. Some systems have larger uh, accretion uh, reasons and the others are more compact. And, okay, orbital inclination measurements for the linear process is a very important tool. And
and they can also be used to reveal the spin period of the whiteboard. Uh, this part has massive photometric campaigns in some systems. You have especially uh, these uh, un unsynchronized systems, you always very, try to be very tricky in the, in using the, in the FFPs and clean algorithm to find the, what's the real uh, uh, it's like the spin period and also warm over If you have lots of the sidebands in the FFTs, it's, it's not very straightforward to say that, okay, this is that period and that's the B period. But if the system is magnetic and, okay, then the magnetic, uh, uh, the, I mean, the quartz is in the original and close to the surface of the whiteboard. So if you can see this clear period, you know, circular polarization, where I mean this, so you can then quite often say, uh, fix that, okay, that's the real uh, speed barrier of the light bulb. That's why it's only one. So we are doing this kind of modeling, a little bit like what you saw previously, a little bit similar kind of modeling, but uh, as in the, we can derive this the location of these spots, accuracy spots, they are always a little bit tilted, or uh, uh, the magnetic pole is tilted from this, uh, uh, from the, this uh, rotating, and then you try to, uh, the feet, the polite curves, and, and especially more of the circular polarization and variation with using the cycle and uh, initial models. Okay, tools uh, for modeling CV. Uh, one of the main tools has been uh, UT1 nowadays, but re previously was UT2, but then the UT1 with the force instrument force at the ESO. This is a multi mode. Uh, instrument, a little bit similar like the alpha scatter knot, so the image in polarimetric, long sleeve and multi object periscopy, etc. Optical instrument mounted at the uh, Cassegrain focus, so equal here that's in Cassegrain focus. And that's why the photo remote telescope is also perfect for the, the polarimetric because, and actually that's why the, like the Johannes Andersen was uh, just recently very heavily claiming that that's the new the Finnish biases. It, it was made in 1980s, so due to Finnish demands that it has to have a custom kind of focus because due to polarimetry. I mean, if you put uh, in a, some national focus, the polarimetry instrument, it will, uh, will have a, a pointing, bending uh, instrument of polarization, so which is quite tricky to model and uh, like quite, quite awful to handle these kind of uh, effects. So the old uh, polarization instruments should go to be in custom kind of the care force, and the force works in a optical wavelength up to the near infrared and um, you can have lambda 2 or lambda 4 plate so lambda 2 makes the possible the linear process and the lambda 4 makes the possible circular part session uh, and here's some pictures from the Lawrence from the last February when me and Arthur was there we had this t pux probe this is the force this is the small instrument at the VLD like those beside the flash platform uh, this national platforms here are much more uh, uh, bigger in this size. And even this is uh, the size of the small mini car, a small car almost like a small car, uh, similar size. Yeah. Okay. And the historic test of La Palma has been a very powerful tool. Uh, and uh, yeah, especially the tour which is nowadays used by uh, quite a few people. But uh, for example, I have done it previously quite often, but not so much recently because the, uh, with the tour body band at the north, we have gone up to the 17 monitoring stars. But, but recently, uh, if you have uh, some uh, new, new X ray targets, which are easy to 19 or 20 monitor, then you have to choose the Alphos uh, into some imaging polarimetric. And uh, why we need the big telescope here, the polarimetric? The main reason is the high signal to noise. Uh, what we need for polarimetry. Uh, uh, for polarimetry astronomy, uh, if you want to do the, uh, like in circular polarimetry, the, ac uh, the accuracy of half person, which is not high accuracy actually, it's quite low, then you, then you have, uh, should get a signal that was 100 to 140 above. But if you want to go something like the 0.3 percent accuracy polarimetry, you need a signal that was 240 something like that, and easily you want, want to go even higher than that, something like the signal the noise 300, 400, the, to get those errors as small as so, it, so it's, if you are hunting for a weak polarization effect, and if you have a one person the error pass, then it's a, you know, almost uh, desperate hunt some very weak effects, but uh, this means a lot of 
photos. And that's why the purple there has been actually quite good in for bright target because it has a photo cloud again. And it, it's a totally linear system from zero to two million comps. And this is very important. If you do a polar meter, you can get to like to something like two million counts. But with the CCDs, this pattern is a, it's a, it's a bright target. You have this uh, quite uh, limited linearity up to the 65,000. So that's uh, that's why with the bright target, the turbo is totally superior to do the the, the actual polar meter. But of course, when if the, if the target is 19 magnitude and you try to do polar meter with tur turbo, it's just a noise. Then you have to have something like the, this alpha. Uh, sorry, this is alpha, and this is turbo. But, uh, but even the, the spectral polarimetry, which you not, you can go that uh, 15 magnitude, something like that. And even with uh, that, yeah, with the 8 meter class VLT, and if you uh, want to do the spectral polarimetry, reasonable limits are like something like 17 magnitude. You cannot do the uh, any reasonable spectral polarimetry with uh, VLT, the target is are 20 magnitude or fainter. Or you can do the emitting polarimetry of those from up to the 21, 22 magnitude. But uh, in the photometry, the VLT emits out to like 27. Uh, okay, it depends what, how high the signal the noise you need, but, but in, in practical, it's something like 27 magnitude, what you can do with the photometry. Then emitting, emitting uh, polarimetry 22, 21, spectral polarimetry 17 magnitude only. But that's uh, actually you can drop it will drop with the spectral polarimetry when you put the walls on the prism, sleep everything there the, uh, the, uh, between the detector and the light source. You drop the 10 magnitude uh, from the limit magnitude away in VLT. And in, there has been many cases the targets we have been running to make the up the uh, case uh, proposal for observing that and we have realized that oh god it's uh, too small then it's small but even this eight million class <laughs> And that's uh, the problem. Yeah. Okay, some examples shortly. Uh, but this is the very short uh, orbital period CV, close to the tier, uh, what has been measured, the shortest 79.8 minute uh, called TT Leo. Good example of the turbo data. But, uh, the, the one uh, 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 of the turbo is that you can do the same, uh, the five optical bands at the same time. Uh, like you normally with the autoscape said that if you want to do UVVRI studies, then you have to do them separately in each band. It takes five more, five, uh, more, more, five more times the time to do first U band, then B band, etc. But here with the group you can do it at the same time. Okay, and here you can see this is the one uh, 80 minute here and then and again. Again, you see here the strong color dependency, the blue, almost nothing, and then in the B it starts to be, especially the uh, red part, it shows the, uh, up to the 20% the strong optical polarization and then disappears. Here, how you would explain this? Okay, here the stars is rotating. Uh, we, we, we start to see this uh, dominating aggression pole. Actually, what is here uh, in optical light curves, see the small. Uh, uh, eclipse, well, not actually the real eclipse, but the eclipse to the accuracy stream. And you can see also in the polarization that sometimes it drops during that uh, when the accuracy stream is hiding a short time, the, the, the hot spot here. Then it rotates, we see here the, the almost uh, face on the, the, the hot spot, then it finally starts to go behind the corner of the white rod, then it disappears. And at the, during that moment, you will see the linear data, the linear pulse. And then again, the next uh, cycle starts, and then it goes similar up again and again. Uh, and here, the photography. Uh, totally unlimited data here, with the turbo. And you can go up to here, the 17 uh, magnitude with turbo. And here you can see that, especially in the blue band, you see that this short, which is uh, just less than 10 minutes, so just a few minutes short uh, eclipse to the accuracy stream here. And interesting when you compare this to the X-ray satellite data, ROSAT data, you can see exactly the, uh, with using the same uh, uh, same uh, phasing and same ephemerate, you can see that the, there was in an X-ray data similar uh, eclipse to the accuracy stream, exactly which matched very well this 
And so it was very cool to see, okay, they, this is some original also. Yeah, this extra sort of thing, uh, okay taste, you could, you could, you could call it aqua stream, okay taste in here. It matched very well with X-ray data. So. And also the strong dependence here is due to cyclotron beam effect. Strong color dependence here in the photometric as well as in the yeah, you know, polarimetric. Okay, and this is a linear polar sensor. Which you, you see most of this linear pulse during the weather. This uh, circular polarization of this, uh, this spot is behind the corner. And this is when you see the independent of the magnetic field lines that are line of sight. Okay, so we could estimate magnetic field from this color dependence up to the 25, 30 megadoms, and orbital illumination from the linear polarization. And most part of the cyclonic originates from the accuracy region, which is located on this kind of, we got some estimates where this what spots should be in this case, for example. And then we have very long orbital periods, CV, which had almost, almost eight hours. Uh, or, uh, this is one of the longest orbital periods, catapultic uh, variables, especially the magnetic systems. It means that it's quite young system, because they evolved towards a shorter period. And test for the synchronization, and you can see that during the observation of several years, use the polarimetric. Uh, it gives some operators for the spin and the orbital period difference. It seems that it was very well synchronized despite the very long orbital period. And we had this was eclipse, this is this eclipse system. And interestingly, because the, the long orbital period in the eclipse lasts some 40 minutes, and eclipse has very strong color dependence. Okay, follow up, so what's was the light data here somewhere. Okay. And very strong, clear polarization, pole plus and minus. Okay, and uh, and this well, you can see that during the eclipse we have a very low signal noise. That's why there's this last error pass here. Okay, and okay, we need also to discover spectro spectroscopy using the H alpha beta uh, heading lines. To the, we could do this pair, uh, spectrogram, uh, which actually these are the velocities and. You can see uh, C right in your H alpha where the most you can use this uh, for example see, see where the most of the H alpha emission is originate. And this is the calculate trajectory of the this mass transfer, for example, these are the components and the same with the like H beta where we look where which part of this uh, the system the H beta emission is right coming. Okay, this uh from separate nights, these are like all the different nights in the eclipse change the changes here. It was a, and thanks to the high, sigma, uh, high time resolution of the turbo photometry, you could do these kind of uh, nice studies about the accuracy profile change during the night from the night. Like normally, if you have a, a classical accuracy system, it goes very quickly, very boosts, drops to the accuracy. But here, especially in the, which is accuracy very deep in the blue and blue, uh, so it, it means that it has a huge accuracy stream. It has some glow, uh, so it's the so it's not close like classical. It just disappears behind the limb of the white open. No, it, it takes quite long to uh, reach the bottom. Uh, and so, okay, the modeling. Uh, this was the idea that we see this uh, uh, when it goes to the edge, uh, we we will see the uh, and when it comes to either the end. Uh, uh, eclipse, or when it comes up, up from the eclipse, we will see this uh, last accuracy stream uh, well before, and that's why it's, uh, the shape of the eclipse is like that and not like a classical, uh, very fast for okay. Yeah. We've got the estimate from this color dependence of the circular polarization for magnetic fields up to 50 to 60 megadoms, and orbital inclination was, by any way, it was an eclipse system, it has to be quite high, but from the linear process, you get a quite good. Estimate for this also, and, and you could model where the, these hyper hotspots are located. Okay. okay, and then the question was having also this lower uh, 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 the system which has low AR have assumed to be less magnetic, like the intermediate polars. But we have uh, recent years, if you have like this, we cannot data. That this had a magnitude like 20 to 30 megawatts, similar strength like in the polars. And yeah, very nice, uh, up to a few percent of the circular process. And, and yeah, okay. 
And you can even use this kind of uh, plotting uh, from the system to estimate what is the magnetic field moment of the white dwarf here. So the like this inverted versus magnetic moment diagram. So the here the, these letters are S, V, uh, E, V, and R indicates like the parameters like in, if your system like the, you just plot here the, the speed barrier and for example uh, and then there is a magnetic uh, moment of the white dwarf. When if it would have a like a stream like a at present then it should be like here and propeller here and the disk accuracy is like here and, and ring the light flow which is very rare uh, and the system is trying to uh, settle in this line here so you can use this kind of a calculation to model the, uh, with certain parameters like what should be the magnetic field moment of the light flow but then you could estimate do this kind of estimates for uh, what kind of what is the magnetic field moment, magnetic moment of this white dwarf in intermediate polar is it much different uh, compared to the polar flow? And yeah, it's a good question. And still, we are, uh, it's not clear that they are le less magnetic, at least not, not, not at all. This was interesting, just then. 128 seconds, very challenging observation. Uh, so, this is about two minutes. Uh, we have got lots of data, of course, and then uh, the, the data being. And you can see, especially here in the, uh, with lots of the data, within a two minutes uh, polarization variation. Yeah. With target, which was, this is, uh, well, this is something like 16 or 17 magnitude. Yeah. And this is the one of the trickiest, uh, the famous IA aquariums, which has the shortest spin of the white force, only three, th 33 seconds white force is spinning. And uh, order of it is about 12 hours or something. It's a very, very uh, unsynchronized system. And this is the, let's just think about how difficult this was to observe and to get some VNN data finally, which is still quite noisy. So this is the half minute, the, the femorbid of a, that's sort of the spin phase here, is half minute. So, uh, but we could still see something, some uh, reasonable over this, but it's a little, little bit marginal detection. And also this IEF part is well known to have a huge variation in it, especially in the blue uh, from night to night. One night you might have, especially in the blue band, the total is sporadic variation like this. And the next night there was no flickering. So it's very, very tricky. But this is a the system actually. It's just losing mass, it's throwing mass away from the system. This IEF part is very weird. And then there's some example of VLT used here, the new home by. 18 magnitude targets, uh, I don't know, 800 something speed barrier. And uh, VLT is such a powerful, uh, you could see the circular process in here. This is totally one minute, of course, then you can mean here the data and get the length, but I just saw the one minute data from VLT in yeah. imaging polarimetry for, uh, for 18 magnitude target. It's quite powerful with that, but, but even if you would choose the uh, spectral polarimetry, it would be too faint to do in a reasonable spectral polarimetry. But with the imaging polarimetry, the uh, 1800 target VLT, you can see, see nice, nice data even with unbeaten, see the clearing of polarimetry in here. Okay, that's all. Uh, but I can show you a few examples of the one target also. Uh, if you have any question of that, I can ask about, and I can show shortly a few that what I'm going to talk about more and so some very near things which I have been wondering here. Yeah. But, but uh, if you have any question about this, what I just uh, talk you could ask. Any? Yeah. Is there any uh, opportunity for our tests? Yeah, lots of. The, for example, what Arco and the Uvascular team had and the uh, uh, Sirius had done quite a lot. Because especially the classical NOVA, they have this like Warf Novice has constantly this Warf Novi outburst, and then there are that's like SEU Humanite uh, Novice has quite like, huge outburst, and of course they're very interesting are recurrent Novice, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. And, and yes, so lots of things to do with uh, small amateur astronaut clubs. But because the monitoring with these large telescopes is something what you can do. Despite that, like Argo is a very good example of what Argo has done over the several years. Uh, they can 
Arco and uh, the, his collaborator can actually get a real physics out of that. And I, I, I will say here one heavy claim. Uh, those things what Arco and the others are doing, we will get the better physics out of that than in most cases using a real inside telescope. If you look at many papers which has written yes, it's part of the use 10 meter class telescope. Of course, nice spending, nice modeling and all kind of parameters, but mostly like all kind of signal and, uh, and more data needed. And okay, we got the, with this parameter goes, this spectrum fits well. But the big question is, where the one is super are coming, for example? Uh, and these kind of uh, fundamental questions are very fundamental astronomical questions in astrophysics. I guess we, we get most cases get uh, more answers having uh, something uh, which you can uh, monitor over years. And especially our uh, system is very ready to turn somewhere where it's interesting happens. Something which you cannot say to academics in different countries which give the money for the big telescope. Because they, they, there has been a, every, every, almost every country in recent years the demand you should close the most smaller telescope, like in La Palma, where now they even right now this has started. This, right now they are soon started to, you, probably, you, you know the better, but they start to uh, do the very first time uh, to destroy the small telescope in La Palma, which is K, A, KBR, the Swedish telescope this time. And you can then just wonder what next. Uh, and also the La Silla, uh, was, they were, it was closed two years ago to close La Silla, uh, not where the Parana was, uh, uh, was running so well. And despite the La Silla telescope, medium sized telescope, produced a huge amount of paper every year. Paper. But uh, some uh, bureaucrats wanted to get something to close. But the Andres Kaufer managed, managed to save it with this 2010 plus plan. Uh, so that the, 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 the Parana La will stay more or less there, but still, there's a constant threat that they will close this monitoring telescope. And, and yeah, so it is, of course, always a matter of money. Yeah, but you can the one the Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, if you can secure the money, then the money will be secure. If you can secure funding for them, it's, uh, it's a... If you get enough funding for all of your telescopes, it's essentially good uh, when the sort of cutting edge or what people want to talk as cutting edge science uh, advantage towards bigger telescopes. Because that means that if you still can operate a small telescope, you get more time with it and, and, uh, and you get this time coverage. And for those who were here in the morning, uh, when I said that uh, hype is one of the most important instruments that we can have having astronomy, it is what, what I meant. Because uh, time is very good time coverage is immensely important, but it's also from big telescope it's pretty much impossible to get because it's so com competitive. Yeah. So 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 for, for that you, you either need dedicated dedicated small telescopes or uh, very interested and involved amateurs. Yeah, actually that's uh, most of it needs the uh, amateurs because. Uh, well, like in Finland, is a very good example. We have now many active clubs which have a half meter sized telescope and good CCDs. And so, even they even with this climate, they can collect the nice data. And of course, that what the other have this robotic telescope in uh, like Atacama is a superb example of that. You also have some telescope there as well. Okay, yeah, well, they don't know exactly. But I, despite that, I'm a professional I'm an astronomer, and I, I really underline the importance of monitoring of small telescopes. Yeah, long term. Yeah, long term. Yeah, there, there's this catchphrase that many people are, uh, uh, are, are saying that uh, you should do big science with small telescopes. People are doing it. Yes. Yeah. And also another question is that if there's something interesting happening, you should turn the telescope there. Okay, you have to send an application half year period. Okay, next uh, deadline will be within a few months and then, uh, well, you cannot. Okay, then there are these uh, programs for supernovae, it's like the uh, it's uh, so, so, that, so that trigger if the, there will be the warning on the supernovae, they will turn or either gamma reverse. Okay, but but that uh, it works in something like a gamma reverse. Gamma reverse is okay, but but still, like this, what, uh, what for example, what Argo has done, well, these kind of all kind of uh, outbursts of the novel, uh, normal novel, whatever, uh, you cannot get easily these for like, such a program like they have in the gamma reverse. Yeah. But, but I really like to have a, also a small telescope. 
and the emergency set have to make the choice of each one you like with the big monster or lots of the small, of course. I would say lots of the small, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you almost have targets. What? You have targets or you, you know about CBA, you can set up backup with some astrophysics? Sorry, the CBA, you know CBA? I mean, you're working for CBA. Oh, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I know that, yeah. Uh, yes, I have uh, some targets which I might propose to you and Arthur if you, yeah, but there are yeah. But I would actually I would guess that uh, you should get in uh, more and more uh, as uh, a proposal from our uh, professional astronomers, uh, especially like this KDA would be close. I mean, there's people in Finland who have been used, probably they have a contact you already. That's, you can see, yeah, you can see it, how important it is to have this monitor telescope. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I, I might show a few examples uh, which we. Uh, this is a good example of the, this part of, okay, this, this project had been involved. Big and there's big telescope and small telescope. Arthur has monitored this team Pukes for a long time for Brad Schaefer uh, as a main collaborator. And we got the last year the not fast track service program observation for spectrobiometry with Arthur's accident. The fast track service program normally the, the spectrobiometry is not even possible, but we ask it and they. Uh, Thomas said, okay, yeah, hey, it can be done. And, uh, and I, I can show that some, some uh, results were not uh, very, very preliminary results. And uh, I will talk about more that. And uh, we got the ELD run, which is still uh, I'm analyzing the Yes, but uh, hmm. uh, the, this is the spectrum of uh, polarimetry. The polarimetry results from the T Fuchs. Because in our own prison, uh, we, we got the four hours, which are actually about two different uh, orbital cycles of this. And, okay, it's a little bit noisy, but mostly it's uh, like this, you can say that it's close to zero. This is uh, done so that it's, you see the point here is uh, it was five, 15 data points, it's a heavy beam to get the error, error smaller, so it's each beam has uh, 15 data points here. Because uh, yeah. and with the prism four, it started somewhere a little bit below five thousand, but it's uh, but but it's actually start work better just a little bit after five thousand, and mm -hmm. it uh, extends along to the nine thousand something actually. Yeah. But here in the nine thousand long something, the uh, yeah. flux is very very weak. But here in principle, okay, you have something here, but in principle, uh, if you look how this scatters, they are close to zero. Uh, so okay, and in most cases it's like that. Most like that, but what what I then noticed in few cases was like mm -hmm. that. What compared to other spectrum and as well as better polarimetric. Here you can have a very clear path, like a, you can see a, this exactly the cyclotron halves, and here it goes up to the set in the negative side, side in seven thousand amps and goes back. And this is this is not a, okay. If it would have been just a one example. But then later it happens similarly, okay, similar happens later. Uh, if the, even the, if the just the one measure, one spectrum would be aerobics, but then later, uh, uh, whereas it, uh, normally it shows like, like next spectrum like that, almost nothing. But then, two spectrum from this, two different, okay, the, the, the spectrum is so that uh, because it has to take two different angles, so the so this is uh, about one point eleven orbital phase the when it's collected uh, when integrating and take the different angles. But this cannot be aerobics. But but then what is so interesting that if you think about it, of course in a one square orbital period, this this does not match the the, the time difference of this does not match at all with the uh, orbital period from photometry. This is very well calculated by Arthur and Brand. It's very accurate calculated photometry. But this, when this happens, doesn't match that at all. I, I don't know exactly how to explain this. This is very weird. But I know that these are not rubbish. And now I'm analyzing the VLT uh, data. We got the blue prism and red prism. So I'm analyzing and still wondering what's going on. <laughs> Wait. 